Hi everyone, it's time for the weekly update from the Allotment for Life plot. And uh, yeah, it feels a bit odd having a sweater on after like, I don't know, 10 days of over 30 degrees, but um, it's definitely a change in temperature and um, we are expected thunderstorms shortly. So today I'm planning on talking about tomatoes, blight and yeah, what to look out for and what isn't blight and also what you can do to maybe mitigate the risk. So to do that, I thought we'd start outside with my outdoor tomatoes before the rain starts, Hey, eh? <laughs> Let's see if we can manage. And uh, how amazing is that sunflower? It's my biggest sunflower. It is variety Kong. So it has a big head, tall, like very thick stem. Um, I did not grow it from seed and that is the difference. That's why it is the biggest I have. Because <laughs> I apparently cannot grow, even if I get the seeds for giants, um, I can't seem to grow them big. So this one I got uh, as a seedling, quite tall seedling for, in exchange for a loofah plant. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I guess, um, I don't know what I do wrong. I guess I plant them out too late probably or something. Anyway, tomatoes. So uh, I have indoor and outdoor tomatoes and I'm gonna say that me, like a lot of other people, went a bit tomato crazy this year. Partly because it just was such a big year for tomatoes last year on Instagram at least. Um, some beautiful photography by some big accounts with lots and lots of cool new varieties and with amazing names and everyone was so excited, uh, including me, and we went a bit crazy, right? So um, I have a lot of tomatoes this year, as you may know, and I'm not alone in that. And that sort of has meant that um, to fit them all in, you know, we've taken shortcuts, haven't we? We've planted them too close to each other and we have maybe been blessed in the last few years with not having early onset blight in the UK um, or at least here so we kind of become a little bit complacent um, but um, by the sounds of it looking at other growers blight is early this year so right let's talk about it so I have my outdoor tomatoes growing here uh, the, the front here are tomatillos and um, they are bushing out nicely and they are a relative but not as not close enough of a relative that they apparently suffer from the late blight that we would get on tomatoes and potatoes right so tomatoes and potatoes are susceptible to late blight and I have tomatoes a few beds up and um, other f members of that family is aubergines or uh, chilies and peppers as well, but they also apparently don't suffer from late blight. They get other fungal diseases that might look like blight, but it the main difference is that it doesn't spread as quickly as uh, late blight does. So anyway, yes, as you can see, these are all very, very close. They are just over a foot apart and really ideally a tomato plant would like to have three foot be three foot apart so it has um, you know a lot of space because they are such big plants I like to spread out you see here they're so close that all the leaves are touching each other even though I prune hard they are still touching and I try to remove leaves are the worst culprits right but yeah so these are perfect conditions for blight to just rip through here and why I'm saying that is because blight is a fungal disease and like mushrooms they spread on the wind through spores that are released in the air from the fruiting bodies so I guess you could consider blight to be endemic in the UK as in it's always here lying in wait for the right conditions. Oh the church bells are ringing. 
So like other fungus, like mold, for example, um, they do like humid, warm, moist conditions. So a wet summer is usually a bad blight summer. However, this year I would say we have recently had very dry weather. So maybe it is a little bit surprising that it's spreading just now, but I guess we had all that rain in May, at least in the south, in the southeast, there was a lot of rain in May and that has led to the explosion in the blight spores spreading across. So as it is endemic, as in it's always present, it, there's not much you can do about it because you can't control the weather, you can't stop the wind from blowing. So if it is about, it will arrive and it's, you know, the, there are a few things you can try to do to, to reduce the risk. But in the end, you know, it is, it is around and it's, uh, yeah, it's not much that much you can do about it. There are, um, you can be aware of the risk though. There are, there is a website, I can put the link below. I think it's called Blight Spy and it just gives you a warning. It's a warning system, green, amber, red warning system when certain conditions are met in the weather that is uh, predictable blight weather. And <laughs> I've seen it moving across. So starting in the east, the southeast of England and spreading across, almost covering the, almost the whole of the United Kingdom over this weekend because of the warm weather we've had and now the moving the the wet weather moving in and the humidity will be high as well as quite a high night temperature so these are all conditions that are like perfect for blight to spread so it's already present in a lot of growers in uh, Kent for example in London uh, I've seen in the Midlands as well so it is definitely coming and it is time to be aware of it. So blight spores, right? They arrive on the wind and they land on the leaves of tomatoes and potatoes, I, -ish, I should say, but they need a moist surface to be able to infect the plant effectively. And uh, so it's very important, which is one of the reasons why you should remove the lower leaves of your plants because both from rain and from watering you're more likely to get uh, moisture on the leaves if you however though if you go out in the morning you'll notice that there is uh, dampness on the leaves from dew and also respiration of the plant so it is impossible to completely eliminate moisture and it wouldn't be healthy for the plant to do that anyway so there is still periods of the day when the leaves are wet uh, so which adds to the difficulty with blight on outdoor tomatoes and on potatoes that are over there. All right, so what should you be looking out for then? Um, well, blight is something that occurs on otherwise healthy green uh, plant parts, right? So I removed a leaf this morning and I am not sure whether it is blight or not. Um, let's see, here it is. So this is an otherwise healthy leaf and it's got this brown patch. So, and it's gone through to the other side. It has uh, not exactly formed a window like in it is wet and see-through. So I'm not 100% sure it's blight. It could just be a million other things that affect tomato plants in our climate. Um, this is another leaf of the same plant, which is also showing yellowing and brown spots. However, these two alone at this stage is not enough to say, oh, this is blight. Um, so I remove them just in case and I will um, dispose of these not in my compost heap. You can either, if you think it's blight, you can either burn it or put it in your green waste from the council. And that is because to kill the spores, you need to have a certain high temperature in the composting system and you can't guarantee that in your home composting. So it would be safer to burn it or put it in the green waste, right? So, I remove these leaves as soon as I see them and I, I, I do that generally for my tomato plants as soon as I see any discoloration of the leaf on most plants 
actually, I remove them because either it is a sign of aging and they are no longer of much use to, to the plant and if I remove them I don't encourage slugs to move in and start munching on because they are uh, made aware it's a signal to slugs and other creatures that feed on decaying matter to move in right so I, I remove tried to remove these anyway um, but the thing about blight is that it moves super quick through the plant especially in conditions like we have this weekend so I would very quickly be aware uh, if I go and check maybe even tonight or tomorrow morning and that plant has more of these brown patches and if I would leave the leaf on and check 12 hours later and it has spread a lot that's another good sign that is probably blight when you know for sure though which is how I knew last year is when it starts affecting the fruit and the stem. So the stem tends to go, I'll just show you on the plant. So on the stem, you would see, ooh, you would see a whole section like this just go brown. And in, that's the first, step. then it would also start to rot and it would spread very quickly. The other thing you would see is on green fruit, it would all of a sudden develop brown patches. Not on the bottom, because that's very likely to be blossom end rot from irregular watering. But on the sides here, obviously you can be unlucky and it can happen underneath and you can mistake it. But if it happens anywhere else, it is probably blight. So those are the two, three things to look out for. Checking the leaves for, for brown spots. If it is lots and lots of brown dots, I would say it is one of other one of the other diseases that affects tomatoes. You can Google that and just have a look. Make sure you are looking at a UK specific website though, because there are lots of diseases that we don't have in the UK. And uh, speaking about that, so we what I'm talking about here today is late blight, um, which is what we have affecting our plants in the UK. There is something called early blight, but that's a different species of fungus that is mainly a problem in North America. Uh, so what we are talking about today is early onset late blight. It's not early blight, okay? So if you're Googling, make sure that you're reading about late blight. Uh, it can affect us in the UK from June already to, you know, September, whenever your plants um, die anyway or the fungus die from frost. So let's have a look at the potatoes and see what they're like. So they are uh, very tall this year and uh, I've obviously been harvesting my first earlies and I have a f two more plants of the second earlies and one of the buckets of the second earlies left. So the key with potatoes is that the early varieties will most likely finish and be ready to harvest before blight becomes a problem. The main crop, however, which takes 20 weeks or more to, to maturity, that's where you can end up with, with a problem um, or a bigger problem. These are uh, the main crop and I have two uh, pathetic looking uh, Charlottes. So these plants are dying, like they're mainly bindweed right now. I haven't been able to weed this uh, so they are showing a lot of signs of decay, right? So this isn't blight. This is just the plant going old and this is main crop next to it and I'd say this is the same thing, right? It's not spreading rapidly and it isn't, it isn't a wet rot, if you see what I mean. Uh, it doesn't have a bullseye of yellow around the brown spots and it's just the normal you know, it, it'll be some disease or other, but it, it, it will be, uh, it's an, it doesn't, it won't kill your crop, right? So what I need to do uh, with my second earlies is to get them out of the ground, because I noticed this one was poking up, hence it's green, and it's also been severely eaten by slugs and wood lice, so I don't want to lose all my potatoes to those critters. Right, so that's what happens. The plant dies and if you don't harvest them um, in a timely manner, 
you get a lot of pest damage. So potatoes, unlike beetroot, which can be left in the ground as a, as a storage, potatoes should be lifted, right? So because of the, the rapidness of the spread of blight, so blight infects the host plant, it starts to rapidly reproduce and produce those fruiting bodies again that then sends out the infectious spores and if like for example my tomatoes the leaves are touching each other from plant to plant same with the potatoes the leaves are touching so once it sets into that patch it will spread really really quickly so in an allotment site for example where the concentration of potatoes and tomatoes is very very high you know it will set in and it will sweep through the, that allotment site very very rapidly in a garden it is maybe less risk of blight being nearby because a lot less people grow vegetables in their gardens however that's obviously dependent on where you are and how um, <laughs> how many veg fanatics you've got around you um, so you are less likely maybe to suffer from blight in your garden so that's something to bear in mind um, if you've if you've been really burnt this year however I know in London I think it doesn't really matter where you are so depending on how densely populated the the veg grows are blight will be more or less of a problem so obviously blight is an awful awful thing to happen especially this early on so I, like many other people, have not had a ripe tomato this year. And it's just cruel that we've got blight this early in the year. I mean, other things are growing well. The squash, uh, the corn, the beans, you know, the beetroots are growing very well. I've had a great pea year, still need to get rid of the plants. And, uh, you know, so things are growing well. Um, you know, chart. You know, you have to celebrate what's growing well, but it is so heartbreaking that before you even have had a ripe tomato, you might have to rip all your plants out. Right? You know how upsetting is that? You've invested so much time. You might have sown them in March or in February even, and you've babied those plants, and this is the end. So I think we should all mentally prepare ourselves that that decision might have to come soon. If we're lucky, we'll escape it in where we are growing, but you never know, right? And it's better to be prepared for the disaster and then it doesn't come. <laughs> well, that's my, that's, my, uh, that's my way of thinking about it anyway. So there's some responsibility that comes with having an allotment and one of them is, of course, to deal with blight as soon as you see it. On tomatoes, you can try to halt the spread by removing infected leaves like I had done with suspected leaves. Uh, if it's affecting the stem you can cut that plant below that brown mark, get rid of that, any, any affected fruit, get rid of those and that might give you enough time for the plant to ripen the fully formed tomatoes that are already on the plant, right? It won't grow more and produce more fruit but the ones that are there you might give it enough time to ripen those if all else fails or if the weather doesn't look like it's going to be good um, you can remove the fruit that looks fully formed and put them on a sunny windowsill and try to ripen them that way so at least you get some tomatoes um, otherwise it isn't much you can do. I know that people who saw blight in the now in the heat wave that we had actually didn't see much spread, especially if they reduced their watering. Um, but I think now with the wet weather that's coming in, it's not going to be, it's nothing more you can do about that. But it is a good point. You can um, reduce watering uh, to remove more, more sources of humidity. With potatoes, if you see blight, um, you want to leave the plants until maybe a quarter of the leaf is infected. Or, you know, I mean, that's that's up to your allotment site. If they want you to chop them down immediately, then you, you obviously have to follow the rules. Um, but ideally, you would leave the foliage on until 
uh, about a quarter is infected because you want to give the plant time to put as much energy into those spuds as you can and then at that point because you don't want to risk the the fungus going down into the potatoes which they will eventually um, so you chop the foliage off at the ground level you burn that you put that in the green waste and then you leave the potatoes in the ground for about two weeks until the skins have hardened and then you can harvest them potatoes that are infected with blight will be mushy they might be like a brown um, discoloring under the skin at first and then in storage they will rot very quickly so so the spuds that you get might not store for very long um, and if you have blight on your tomatoes you might want to be proactive with your potatoes or vice versa so bear that in mind uh, you should be able to get some potatoes at least Obviously the main crop will not be fully formed and it will affect the yield but at least you will get some potatoes and any potatoes that you do get you need to check regularly through storage and remove any that are showing signs of rotting because otherwise it will just wipe the whole the whole thing out right so yeah. So if you are removing leaves um, I tend to or if you are chopping stems off I tend to use my hands for the leaves um, or fruit but if you need to chop or use a secateur, make sure that you clean the secateur if you can between each cut so you don't spread it that way and importantly wash your hands before you go from one patch of tomatoes until another one right for next year which is something I should have done this year is to not practice monoculture like I've done here and put all my tomato plants in one spot but to spread them out across your plot because because my plants are so close together, they're all touching, if it gets in here, it is likely to spread to all the other plants in a very, very short space of time. If I'd spread them out across my plot, it would have taken a longer time for them, potentially, to spread to each plant, and it would have given me more time to ripen tomatoes on the ones that were last infected. There are varieties that claim to be blight resistant, however, they are not likely to withstand a heavy onslaught but it's worth looking into for in my experience uh, I had blight last year on my outdoor tomatoes it's sort of expected towards the end of the season uh, it's sort of maybe what kills you plant before the frost unless the frost does um, and I got them I think September right and uh, the last one if I, actually I don't even think it got blight was the sun gold an f1 variety and uh, you know I can't sing its praises enough it's very very reliable um, even outdoors and um, yeah if it's if it has some blight resistance too that's great potatoes apparently there are a lot of the um, a lot of varieties that claim to have blight resistance but supposedly or apparently from my reading there are new uh, strains of blight around you know it keeps evolving just like just like um, the other C one that we won't mention um, and um, it they apparently the new variants uh, will affect the the blight resistant ones However, they're, they're working on it and they're developing new ones all the time. So maybe um, you want to look into new, new varieties that claim blight resistance and try those. And hopefully they will be up to date and um, will show some. So in, and in the same manner, heirloom variety tomatoes or uh, old classic potato varieties will be highly susceptible to blight which is probably as well another reason why blight is hitting us bad this year because a lot of us are glowing, growing uh, heirloom tomatoes, aren't we? So they, <laughs> they will have no resistance for blight, unfortunately. But uh, another thing you can do, obviously, is grow your tomatoes under cover. So let's go have a look in there. We managed to escape the rain. That's great. So the reason why having your plants your tomato plants in a greenhouse or i guess your potato grow bags under cover like that is obviously it protects against rainfall and you can sort of be more um more controlled in terms of watering and humidity levels however it's not bulletproof and while while the spores sort of have to navigate and get in 
through the through the doors or the open vents or whatever you know it will still you need to ventilate your space <laughs> so it will probably get in but seeing as the humidity might be a bit lower in here because we don't have rain um you might escape it in a greenhouse however if it gets in your polytunnel if it gets in your greenhouse it will rip through <laughs> all of it because yeah it is just perfect conditions in here so uh, this is my pota potato, this is my tomato house and uh, I have spoken previously about how I prune mine super hard and especially this year because I have so many in here and I just want to keep them as slim as possible and um, yeah they are growing. Some of them are now reaching up to the ceiling and they are uh, forming fruit, but I have not had any ripe ones in here. I am hopeful for the Sun Viva or the Sun Gold, um, but nothing yet. So we're still we're still waiting. And I have also crammed in melons, cucumbers, chilies, peppers, uh, marigolds, basil. You name it. Two lufa plants at the back there, and it is really rammed. And I'm also drying garlic in here, right? So. The garlic is dry, so what I'm going to do is to remove that as soon as possible um, to increase ventilation in this space because the tomatoes are now growing up into it, um, which isn't great. So I'm going to remove those, plate them up and put them in storage. They are now dry, you can see it, they're all gone uh, uh, dry, on the, there's no green left, right? But yes, otherwise I'm practicing the same sort of hygiene, wash my hands or use hand gel between um, touching my outdoor tomatoes and my indoor tomatoes and I don't use same tools and I I you know you know me I don't water I haven't watered my outdoor tomatoes since I planted them out they've been through all that rain in May so they're they will have uh, had roots developing well and then we had the drought now uh, 10 days of searing temperatures and no rain and they are fine, right? They are fine. They are looking gnarly as hell, uh, but they already were before the warm temperatures. So they're obviously exposed to the weather as compared to my, my lovely lush looking indoor tomatoes, which have uh, barely any leaf curl. The outdoor ones are really gnarly, but uh, getting back to the point, I rarely water, right? So my greenhouses, because I've got my plants growing in the ground, and it is fairly deep in this greenhouse. I find that they don't need much water. However, you need to be careful, right? So you need to decide in the beginning of the season how often you want to water. And once you've decided on that pattern, you stick to it. If you don't water very often, your plants will look miserable to start with, and then they will send down roots and find the water and they will be better in the long run. Um, but if you can't bring yourself to do that or you know that you're not gonna go away on holiday uh, and not have someone else water for you, then yeah, go ahead and water every day. You know, but, but I know I can't do that. So I water maybe two or three times a week depending on the temperatures. And when I do water, I water um, consistently deep. But it is important with tomatoes to water consistently so that they have a pattern that they get used to so that they know um, they come to expect it, right? Because you don't want to end up with uh, blossom and rot, which I touched on before, which is, if you Google it, a calcium deficiency. But it's not that there's not enough calcium in the soil or in your grow bag. Uh, it is just that it's not made available to the plant because it doesn't it needs water to to utilize it uh, So you don't need to feed it with calcium That's pointless um, You need to water consistently and then you won't have blossom and rot certain varieties are more susceptible to it as well So if you're struggling with one variety every year, then just try not to grow that one <laughs> um, Again uh, cherry tomatoes are much easier to grow uh, compared to the big ones, they suffer much more with blossom and rot. And also, again, the heirloom varieties are more difficult. Uh, you can also have blossom and rot with other plants, like um, um, like squashes, for example. If they get irregular water, it's a similar thing where they start rotting from the, the bottom 
and um, you have to discard the plant. You can still eat the bit that isn't rotten, right? But um, you won't. They won't grow bigger. The other thing you can suffer with from irregular watering is splitting. So I'm not 100% sure that this split here is due to irregular watering. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. It doesn't look like a proper split. It might be damage or something. Um, but it does as well affect other plants. Uh, it, the problem is that it will have been a period of drought. For example, you might have gone on holiday or it's been really dry outside and then you're like, oh no, and you come back and you see them wilting and then you give them a lot of water, right? So that drought, period of drought followed by a, dr a period of lots of rain followed by another drought, you know, this kind of pattern leads to splitting and this affects tomatoes and it's uh, one of the more common ones is kohlrabi. It's also very sensitive to splitting. So they want like a regular <laughs> availability of water. Uh, again, the larger varieties will be more sensitive to this um, compared to the cherries, though it does happen to cherries as well. Um, once they are ripe, the cherries, and they go over, they also risk splitting. So if you see um, a fully ripe in terms of color tomato and it's split, it's probably because you picked it too late. So now <laughs> it's actually sunny. Uh, and it's got quite hot wearing a sweater in the greenhouse. Um, but yeah, I was going to also mention that to protect your undercover tomato crop, make sure that you obviously only water at the base of the plant. Uh, no splashing, but you already knew that. Uh, I use my pots uh, to water into so that it doesn't spread about so much. It kind of limits the evaporation, speeds it up for me, and I think it's just all around works great for me. Um, the other thing as well I've seen some people do, especially in hot weather, is to water the path um, with cold water. and it, the, it, it sort of brings down the temperature in your polytunnel or your greenhouse. And it importantly then also it causes an increase in humidity which I'm sure the plants love especially plants like aubergines or um, other ones who like to grow in tropical climates right uh, even your tomatoes but it is a trade-off because you're increasing the risk of not just blight but other diseases as well so it's not worth it try if you can grow your aubergines in a separate little grow tent I've got them in my hothouse uh, so that I can water those leaves of the aubergine um, because it is quite important. Aubergines love the humidity and also they need moisture on their leaves to sort of stave off infections from uh, uh, spider mites. So, but if I grew my aubergines together with my tomatoes, I would skip that. To me, tomatoes is more important than aubergines, so I would um, uh, I would deny my aubergines that pleasure for uh, in exchange for keeping my tomatoes safe. So that's a, that's something you'd have to think about. I feel like I haven't really gone through the varieties I've got growing in here, so um, now that they've all got fruit forming, let's have a look at them. Obviously, none of them have color yet, so you're gonna have to imagine the color, but yes, let's start. So the first one we have is Rosella, which is a dark, dusky red cherry tomato. And it is one of the slowest growing, but I think it's because it's right next to the door and it's been a bit cooler. Uh, I've had the door open most days, even though, even through the cold, cooler May. Um, so it's definitely been a bit affected by that. I think as well, the melon and the cucumber has also been affected. But it's coming along and we got uh, fruit forming on two trusses so far and a third one is up there. Anyway, uh, the next one up is the Sun Viva. So this is my comparison between Sun Viva and Sun Gold. Sunviva is super tall, right? It's super tall and um, it has got a lot of trusses. No sign of ripening yet. This one has had poor fruit set by looks like, or maybe they are coming. Um, but it doesn't look like they will. Um, this one is almost full um, and apparently the higher up, the larger the trusses. So that will be dependent on the weather. Um, sun gold is smaller, but I think the trusses are closer together and also you get longer trusses. So what I found last year is that in favorable conditions, the trusses will just keep growing, growing longer. And you might be harvesting ripe tomatoes from several trusses right at once because they just keep producing flowers at the tip. And this is one of the ways that sun gold has been bred for 
success <laughs> uh, in that it is great. So if it's the first year you're growing tomatoes, um, especially cherries like this, they don't, you know, when you buy them in the shop, you get the whole truss uh, or even other regular cherries like on the vine and they're all ripe. So that is not how it works in real life. <laughs> That's just how they've been ripened artificially. So you will be picking ripe tomatoes from the base of the truss and then you will be uh, continuously just cropping the truss until it's finished and um, so that's why we'll be picking these ones maybe at the same time as these middle ones here so if you didn't know that now you know <laughs> anyway sun gold and then we have uh, a chocolate cherry which is a completely different truss formation which is very interesting and these are new to me and there'll be another dark cherry variety um, though this truss is again very different but it has branched off so next one is gardener's delight so i think that is a play on gardener's sweet no sorry this is gardener's sweetheart sorry sorry sweetheart gardener's sweetheart and it's a play on gardener's delight but like a lot of people might have told you gardener's delight isn't what it used to be it's lost something in the uh, some of the original genetic information has been lost and it's sort of changed um but anyway these are supposedly heart-shaped cherries uh, or mini plum so we'll see how it goes and uh they are looking a bit odd actually a bit odd shaped but uh, i'm excited about that one it is very very slender it is a slender tall cherry so if you have maybe less space uh, I can probably recommend that variety. Um, back here is orange banana, which is um, an orange, would you believe, um, plum. So this one, uh, I have never grown a plum tomato before, so it's very exciting to me. And this one is new to me. And we have Jen's tangerine, which is um, a small round, bigger than a cherry, but um, not as big as some other varieties and brilliant brilliant tangerine color which is one of my favorites i love orange and yellow tomatoes they have a higher sweetness level so that's my jam and they are coming along and over here is blue fire and it's one of them colored ones so it's starting to shift a bit and uh, we'll see i think it is blue with like speckles of gold or yellow maybe and um, this is, uh, again, one of these with split trusses. So we'll see how they get on. Back here is yellow brandy wine. And it's not going well. It is in a dark corner, back corner of the greenhouse. You see all this greenery at the back there, so it shades it a bit. I don't think it's happy. Um, none of these look like they are forming fruits, you see. Um, so yeah, it was a bit a bit disappointing because this is one of my favorites and bright orange uh, beef steak tomato, maybe that one, but they're all odd shaped. It is a potato leaved, um, like all brandy wines, and it, they are usually good. And I will try growing it again, if, even if it doesn't work this year, but we'll see. Here we have blue bio, which is, um, you know, one of these dark ones and uh, yeah, I mean, it still has some green on it, so it still has some time to go. Um, but yeah, this so far is one of the earliest to form. And here is Milfleur, one of these Centiflor varieties with like a million, a million, um, well, I guess technically a thousand um, flowers and fruits. So they are forming and they are like pointy like this. So th these are yellow. And another one similar to this is Berry's Crazy Cherry. This one is a double. Um, so... I think, I'm not sure what the difference is between this one, Milfleur, which is from Real Seeds, and uh, Berry's Crazy Cherry. They all seem to grow, they both seem to grow the same and have the same color fruit, so uh, maybe I'll have to do a taste test next year. But yeah, so apparently, <laughs> by the looks of it, you don't need, definitely don't need more, more than one of these plants. I've got it growing outside too, and it's still forming these ginormous trusses, so... Yeah, I'm curious to see if it's good, if it's tasty, and I think it's going to struggle to hold up all that fruit once it's formed. Next one is Belarusian Heart, which is one of these big um, um, uh, beefsteaks, 
and it's heart shaped already beautiful uh but yeah, uneven fruit f- set by the looks of it so there's more fruit on the second truss than is on the first one so we'll see this one is galena it is one of my tallest and very regular fruit set here i can't remember the color of this one is but i think it's another uh, orangey yellow and it is um by the looks of it a cherry which i wasn't expecting but look how tight this is a very very different way of growing fruit again and this is lotus which is a beautiful blush yellow i believe and um quite large fruit and is one of the earliest set so one of the earlier beefsteaks by the looks of it and um good fruit sets and very very i like big trusses which makes me worried about weight as well so as opposed to brandy wine which is another beef steak right which is very compact truss which tends to hold the fruit this like imagine one of them big heavy fruits at the end here it's gonna gonna hang down all the way to the ground so i have to look at supporting these so they don't snap oh we got a little a little one of these keep removing these when you see them this is uh, Pesh Vilmore and Andrew, <laughs> which is a famous um, French vegetable uh, breeder, I guess. He produced a lot of varieties. So this is named after him. And it is um, a beautiful pale yellow. And so far, so good, but nothing too exciting. Um, yeah, we'll see what it looks like. This is uh, Barclay tie dye, and it is a speckled beefsteak and it's starting to show its pattern and I stupidly managed to remove the growing tip when I was thinning but what you can do then is to leave one of these suckers to grow and that will form the new growing tip so that's what I've done it will set it back a bit in time but it will catch up next up is black beauty and it is a you know you might have seen that on Instagram and it is um, a beautiful black fruit completely black with maybe some blush uh, red when they're ripe potentially they don't all do the same but it has a crazy um, truss habit and uh, again they are quite large fruits so a little bit worried again and um, yeah there's just lots of branches to these trusses next up is czech breast which is um a quite funny named but it comes from it having nipples at the bottom um which is sort of funny in it um oh but i think it is also another yellow variety lucid gem here which is another colored one this is the one that i thought had a split but i'm not sure about that i don't know what's that what that is um and they are uh going from dark to to yellow i believe so that one is another beautiful one these were sent to me by a friend a few of them have been actually and this is uh sky comish and it's another multicolored one not super exciting as of yet but we'll see when we get the the colors on it and the last one is san marzano which is a um cooking one uh big plum and they are forming what looks like uh, testicles <laughs> right now. Both of them are, oh yeah, you see? This is pretty funny, but yeah, they are perfect for making your own passata or tomato sauce for the canning or freezing. Um, but again, it's next to the door here, so it's not super happy. Plus, plus, it is, um, I've heard, very very susceptible to blight as well so we'll see um, we'll see how we get on there but yes i was gonna leave you there and uh, hopefully you <laughs> managed to sit through all that uh, i will upload my next video on early in early next week because i need to change my release date so i will be able to give you an update whether i've seen any blight de- developing over the weekend and um, yeah i just hope you stay blight free where you are Have a great weekend, guys, and I'll see you early next week.